Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another serial killer spotlight video. Just a quick one before we go into this one. This one is particularly gross. We're talking about Richard Chase, the vampire of Sacramento, dubbed so because of how he would drink his victim's blood. He killed six people in the span of one month and therefore he's often referred to as a spree killer rather than a serial killer. This is a really interesting case intertwined with a narrative of mental health, which kind of makes you ask the question, was Richard Chase really responsible for his crimes? Legally, the answer to that is yes, he was. Richard Trenton Chase was born on the 23rd of May, 1950 to his parents, Richard Senior and Beatrice Chase. He was born in Santa Clara County in California. Now there's not a huge wealth of information online about Richard's childhood. If you've watched these serial killer spotlight videos before, you probably know that I like to go really in depth and focus on their childhood a lot. But there wasn't that much information about Richard as a child. Um, he claimed that his parents were really abusive growing up, particularly his mother, but investigators have found this to be false. Um, but his parents were strict disciplinarians, especially his father. And Richard Senior and Beatrice had a really long and difficult marriage. Um, they would argue constantly, they would have these really, really long arguments that would last for days. Beatrice would accuse her husband of poisoning her, she'd accuse him of dope and infidelity. Um, so it wasn't a happy marriage and I'm sure this definitely had an impact on Richard's childhood. Um, Richard Senior and Beatrice eventually separated in 1972 before divorcing a year later in 73, at which point Richard was 23 years old. For the first eight years of Richard's life, he seemed to be a pretty normal, well-adjusted child. He played in the Little League, he had lots of friends, both male and female. He was just a normal kid. Um, it's said that his father handed out most of the punishment. His father was definitely a strict parent, whether it borders onto abuse, I'm not too sure. Things started to change for Richard from around the age of 10, where he started to display the McDonald triad, which can also sometimes be referred to as the triad of sociopathy. Um, the triad is a set of three factors, and it's been suggested that if any child has any combination of these three factors, or a combination of two of them, it can be associated with violent tendencies later in life. So this triad consists of bedwetting, animal cruelty and pyromania slash arson, which is something we see again and again when we look at serial killers childhoods. Um, bedwetting is something that often causes humiliation for a child, they're often belittled and punished by their parents for doing so. And of course bedwetting is very much an unconscious act most of the time. It can lead to this humiliation that leads to the other two parts of the triad. Um, it's theorised that arson slash pyromania is a first shot at a violent, aggressive child trying to get their anger out. It's just a way to release aggression. And then there's cruelty to animals as well, which is believed to be a rehearsal for what they would later go on to do to their human victims. And it also shows a lack of connection to emotions. Most people would feel guilty for hurting an animal. A child who's displayed the McDonald triad wouldn't show any guilt or emotion whilst harming an animal. The McDonald triad is to be taken with a pinch of salt with a lot of psychiatrists just completely dismissing it. But I do think it's interesting. I don't think we can deny that a lot of serial killers I've covered on this channel do very much fit into those three things, bedwetting, arson, and animal cruelty. But I think it's dangerous to assume that every child who displays these three things will later go on to show these violent tendencies or become a serial killer. That's not the way it is. I think it's more interesting to look at it in the fact that most serial killers do have these three things rather than a child that has these three things will go on to be a serial killer, if that makes sense. But Richard Chase, by the age of 10, was displaying all three of them. His mother said that particularly weird behaviours started showing from around the age of 13. She said that Richard wouldn't sleep, he would stay up all night just cooking. And he would be cooking and burning the food, and so he'd start cooking again and he'd burn that food. And she said that he just left a mess everywhere, it's like he had no awareness of what he was doing. Um, he would also turn up the heating really, really high in the house, then he'd open all the windows, strip naked, and just wander around the house naked, even when they had guests. And this is a boy who's like on the brink of puberty. But despite this, he was still showing to have a normal personality at this point. He was just a normal teenage boy. He got on well with his friends, both male and female. He was doing okay at school, but it was around this point that his grades slowly started to drop. 
Um, when he was around 15, he first started to show romantic interest in girls and he began dating his first girlfriend, which is when he learned something interesting about himself. He was physically unable to maintain or sometimes even get an erection. And eventually this ended his relationship with his girlfriend. This stirred feelings of inferiority and insecurity in him, especially when the rumors began to spread around school that little Rick Chase couldn't get an erection. Is there really anything more embarrassing for a teenage boy? Um, around this time as well, he began dabbling in drugs, mostly marijuana and LSD, and he also becomes dependent on alcohol, and he makes a habit of starting fires and hurting animals. His entire disposition began to change. He went from this very normal child to this rude, withdrawn person who his family didn't even recognise. He stops caring completely about his personal hygiene, he lets his hair grow out, he stops shaving, he only showers once a week, if that. He gets really, really gross. In 1965, Richard gets arrested for the first time at age 15 when he's caught with marijuana. And this leads to a lot of tension between Richard and his father. They would argue constantly about Richard's drug abuse, but also just his lack of hygiene and his general lack of drive in life because at this point his grades at school are dropping significantly. Um, however, in 1968, he does manage to graduate high school and he decides to enrol in college, enrolling at the American River College. He stays on at college until the spring of 1971 when he drops out and never returns. Whilst in college, he visits a psychiatrist for the first time and talks about his inability to get an erection. And he also begins to get a variety of odd jobs in college, never able to hold any one job down due to his drug abuse. And also the gradual deterioration of his mental health. He's getting worse by the day. Um, in 1971, he moves in with two housemates. And although they're aware that he's like Richard a little bit odd, they decide to live with him because he's just a little bit odd. He's fine, surely. Um, but almost immediately, he proves very difficult to live with. He's constantly stoned, he's inconsiderate of his housemates, and he's clearly very paranoid about something. Exactly what he's paranoid about, they never really know. And um, Richard actually boards up the door to his bedroom so nobody can come in or out. And he knocks down the wall in his closet so that becomes his entrance into his bedroom. But his housemates just said that he would hold himself up in his room, he stunk, his room stunk, and it was just all round a bit disgusting. His room was a fortress. Um, so his housemates have enough and they ask him to move out, only he refuses. So his housemates move out instead and new housemates move in. Now these new housemates are actually part of a band and they have band practice in the house. And Richard insists on joining this band in their practice, even though he's not a part of it. And they said he'd just sit in the corner of the room with a drum making very strange howling kind of noises. He thought he was involved, but he was just in the corner howling and banging a drum. Soon, of course, he's kicked out and he goes to move back in with his mother and father, who at this point are on the brink of separation. And his parents obviously have no choice but to accept Richard's strange little quirks. Um, but he would go out all day and he'd rack up hundreds of dollars worth of parking tickets and he'd get constantly pulled over by the police for traffic violations. And he'd never pay any of it off, it was just mounting ticket by ticket. And um, Beatrice said that during this time, Richard was literally unable to hold a conversation. He couldn't sign his name on a piece of paper and he got really violent over the smallest issues. And so Beatrice, not knowing what to do, sends Richard to live with his grandmother, Holly, in LA. And whilst he's living in LA, Richard gets a job working for his uncle, driving a bus for disabled children. This didn't go well. I mean, from what I can find, he actually was fine towards the disabled children themselves, but he just couldn't care for the bus. Obviously, you'd take the bus back to the depot and they would clean it and they would do any servicing that the bus needed, but Richard just wouldn't do this. He would let the bus get really disgusting and he'd let it, like, basically fall apart and he'd never take it to get fixed and eventually his uncle just has to fire him. His grandmother said at this point he becomes nocturnal, he sleeps all day and at night she hears him just wandering around the house and she said that she didn't even recognise this man as her grandson. Um, in April 1973, he goes to attend a party and whilst at this party, he like molests this girl who just grabs her chest. And obviously all the guys in the party are furious with him and force him to leave. 
only he refuses to leave and he sneaks back into the party at which point there's a struggle all the guys are like trying to force him out and a 22 caliber pistol falls out of his belt of course everyone freaks out the police are called and chase has to be reasoned with and taken to jail the next day he's released from jail and he claims that the police officers seriously injured him and he says that he wants to sue the police department which is something his father talks him out of but this is the beginning of something this is the beginning of some really severe hypochondria Throughout this time living with his grandmother, his personal appearance and mental health are obviously decreasing. His grandmother can see it happening before her eyes. He would never speak to other people, including his grandmother, but he would constantly speak to himself. His grandmother said that she would hear him walking around the house, talking to himself, saying, Richard, you're a good boy, aren't you? Yes, you're a good boy. And he would just repeat this over and over and over again. So like I mentioned, it's around this point he starts to develop some severe hypochondria constantly thinking he's got all these different medical ailments. His grandmother said that she would walk into the house and find him standing on his head in the corner of the room, him saying that he was trying to get the blood to rush back to his brain. He complained that his heart hurt and that it had stopped beating. He would say once that somebody had stolen his pulmonary artery. He would put oranges on his head and legs and wrap it in gauze and say that he was trying to get his body to absorb the vitamin C through his skin. He also believed that his stomach was upside down and he thought that his cranial bones, the bones in his head, were moving around and he actually shaves his head so he can watch the bones moving around in his head. Eventually Richard has to move back home to Sacramento where he splits his time between his mother and father's homes. It was obvious at this point that he was in a really bad mental state. His neighbours would complain about him standing on their driveways just staring at their houses and when they tried to confront him he just wouldn't say anything. But his father didn't see it as a mental health issue. This was the 1970s, it's a different time. People weren't aware of mental health really back then. He thought that his son's problems stemmed from misguided values and attitudes and that Richard just needed to get a job and shape up. His mother also doesn't do anything until one day Richard comes to her begging for help because he thought he was dying. He didn't come to her about his mental state. He like, his hypochondria made him think that he was actually dying from something. And so she takes him to hospital, which is when he claims that somebody has stolen his pulmonary artery. And obviously he's kept in hospital for a little bit. And a doctor diagnoses him finally with acute chronic paranoid schizophrenia. But the doctor does write, though the possibility of a toxic psychosis consequent to ingestion of a psychotomimetic drug cannot be ruled out. So the doctor diagnoses him with schizophrenia, but says it could though be a side effect of some kind of drug he's taken. Um, the doctor also writes that Richard was filthy, dishevelled and absolutely foul smelling. Richard is discharged from hospital after just a couple of days when Beatrice turns up the hospital and has a highly aggressive argument with the nurses and basically it tells them that she's taking her son home. Um, his final diagnosis at discharge was chronic paranoid schizophrenic. And things actually do improve slightly after this hospital visit. He begins taking his medication. The hospital give him an oxygen tank to use when he's having a panic attack. All in all, he just seems to be getting better and he manages to gain 20 pounds because he was really, really skinny because he would refuse to eat. Um, he's slightly better for a couple of years before things start to decline again. Um, Richard would apparently destroy the house in an angry rage. He would smash the windows, he would pull the doors off the frames. And Beatrice said she would always call Richard Senior in to calm their son down, but Richard would just get worse. And Beatrice got angry because she thought that Richard Senior was conspiring against her and just making Richard worse. In 1976, Richard is about 26 years old. He begins drinking the blood of rabbits that he purchases from cellar nearby. When his father asks Richard about all of these rabbits that he has just in his home, Richard outright says like, I'm eating them. And his father, I don't think his father really questioned that much because although it's very strange to bring these rabbits into your home and eat them, it's not a crazy thing to eat rabbits. People go out and hunt rabbits all the time and eat them. And so I think his father just sort of brushed it off. But what Richard was doing is he was draining the blood from the rabbits, drinking the blood and then eating the rabbits meat raw. And then in the April, Richard takes things up another step and he actually injects himself directly with the rabbit's blood. When he's drinking it, he doesn't think that the blood is 
dissolving into his bloodstream fast enough. He wants blood directly into his system. So he decides that the best thing to do is inject it directly into his veins. And of course, this makes him pretty ill. He starts vomiting, he can barely move. And when his father discovers him, he rushes him straight to the hospital. But why is Richard drinking rabbit's blood? Why does he think he needs to inject this blood directly into his bloodstream? Um, I think it all stems from his inability to get an erection. You get an erection when blood rushes to your genitals. And this led Richard to believe that he just simply did not have enough blood in his body. This can also be shown when he was standing on his head in the corner of the room telling his grandmother he was trying to get the blood to go to his brain because he didn't have enough blood. And in his head he puts two and two together and just thinks if I don't have enough blood I just need to simply get more blood. Once he's admitted into hospital he tells the doctors that he was poisoned by a rabbit that had battery acid in its stomach. He says that he needs to drink blood because his heart is so weak. Once again the doctors diagnose him with schizophrenia paranoid type. A 72 hour hold is placed on him and he's kept in hospital until he's eventually transferred to American River Hospital where he's to participate in group therapy meetings. But whilst he's at American River Hospital, he's pretty much completely non-verbal. He refuses to speak to anyone. He refuses to attend all of the group therapy sessions. He knows where he is. He knows what the time is. He knows the place. He knows who he is as a person but he just doesn't really sh seem to show much awareness other than that. He's then eventually transferred to Beverly Manor for extended care psychiatric hospital. And Richard makes it very obvious that he doesn't want to be there, but he actually does show an improvement once he's there, eventually participating in more of the group activities. But his desire to drink blood never vanishes. A lot of the nurses suspected that he'd been in the grounds killing animals because they were finding dead birds all over the place, including in the bin in his room. Just, just a little bit of a sign. Um, Richard would apparently go out into the grounds and wander back in covered in blood, but like he wouldn't say anything about the blood, he'd just go about life as normal. Once they even found him in the bushes covered in blood and feathers, like some kind of feral creature. But somehow in September 1976, he's actually discharged. His notes say, thinking much clearer as compared to time of admission, will discharge to be under care of parents and follow up physician. Thought disorder improved. Prognosis, fair, will continue on some medications. Diagnosis, paranoid schizophrenia. Um, Richard, apparently, according to his notes, had shown enough of an improvement to be released back out into the public, but by no means was he cured. So Richard is released from the psychiatric hospital into the care of his parents, and he moves back in with his mum. Only his parents decide to give him his own apartment. They decide the best thing for Richard is a little bit of independence. So they set him up in this new place and make sure he's functioning, they ensure he's taking his medication. And his mother said that at this point he was very easy to handle. I mean, it already been proven for last time that him being on medication was a good thing for him. However, his mother didn't like the zombie-like effect the medication had on her son. So she takes it upon herself to slowly wean him off the drug. And by 1977, he's no longer on any kind of medication. He's no longer seeing any follow-up physicians. And it's no surprise when Richard starts on a downward spiral once again. He decides that he wants to move out of his apartment and he wants to go east. So his mother buys him a ticket to Washington DC. So Richard goes off to Washington DC and arrives back two weeks later with a new car and decides he wants to move back into his old apartment building. Of course, the apartment he left two weeks earlier is now allowed to somebody else, so he gets a different apartment in the same building. His neighbours said they noticed a lot of strange things around this time. Richard would wander around dragging his foot behind him like it didn't work. It did. Um, he would walk into his neighbours' houses completely uninvited. He would walk around just holding a gun, blatantly holding it out in the open, until one day the building manager came up to him and said, like, hey, can you, like, hide the gun because it's scaring people? And so Richard, from then on, whenever he has the gun out, he wraps it in a blanket. And this is important because it shows that Richard is aware of what he's doing. His mental health may be on a decline, 
but he's still aware enough that when somebody tells him that it's gun scaring people, he thinks, okay, I wrap it in a blanket so people can't see it. I'm not saying this to suggest that schizophrenic people, every schizophrenic person in the world has no idea what's going on in the world around them, but I'm just pointing this out so you can be aware of this when Richard later goes on to commit his crimes. Neighbours on multiple occasions would say they'd see Richard walk into his apartment with cats and dogs, only to never see them again. That summer he kills the two family dogs and then kills the family's cat with a shotgun in front of his mother and then smears the cat's blood around his neck. In August he's arrested after he's found covered in blood in the desert near Pyramid Lake in Nevada, about 200 miles away from his home. He's driven out to Pyramid Lake in his car with a dog. He has then seemingly slaughtered the dog in the woods and drank his blood, which is why he's covered in blood. Um, and he's then spotted by people and arrested. And when he's arrested, he says that the blood is seeping through his skin. And then he says that the blood came from a deer that he shot back in May. He's forthcoming to the police about all his personal details, about his name, age, address, but he can't seem to get anything else straight. The rest of the details are all completely garbled. Um, he's actually released when the testing proves that the blood is indeed animal blood, not human blood. And he's picked up by his parents because the police refuse to let his car out of the impound. Um, then he tells both of his parents individually at separate times a completely false story, but the story he tells both parents is identical. Once again, he is conscious enough to tell the same lie, the same detailed lie, to both parents at separate times. And he tells them both that he was hunting rabbits and he got covered in this rabbit blood that he was hunting and then he got arrested and it's all very weird. He doesn't understand why he got arrested. Um, in reality, he'd taken the dog out to the woods and slaughtered it. Yes, he had severe mental problems. Yes, his actions were bizarre but he had awareness, enough awareness to know what he was doing. Once he returns home, he starts to buy dogs from all these different local breeders and he's buying dogs at an alarming rate, one every few days. He even began to steal dogs off the street, taking each one back to his apartment and hanging it before drinking the blood and then eating the dog's meat raw. On December 22nd, 1977, he goes to buy a new 22 calibre pistol. There's a two week waiting period before he's able to actually pick the gun up, but when he buys the gun, he's asked a series of questions involving whether he was a mental patient, had he ever been adjudicated by a court to be a danger to himself or to others, did he have any history of mental illness, he lied on all of these counts and two weeks later he's just handed this gun. And once he got the gun a neighbour would hear shooting inside his apartment and when he was later questioned about this Richard said that he was shooting the voices. On the 16th of December something strange happened. Richard cleaned himself up. He cut his hair, he trimmed his beard, and he spoke to his family about how he wanted to get a job. He starts to shower daily, and he also goes out and purchases a 50 round box of ammunition before buying the same again a few days later. Over the next week or so, his general demeanor, his physical appearance begin to improve hugely. His family completely notice it. It's almost as if he was preparing himself for something. And this something begins on Thursday the 29th of December 1977. Richard would later say he did the following thing because he was mad that his mum wouldn't let him come round for Christmas. It was 8.30pm and 51 year old Ambrose Griffin and his wife Carol had just got back from the grocery store. They'd just pulled into the driveway on his home on Robertson Avenue in Sacramento. Ambrose and Carol are taking all of the grocery bags inside and they're putting all the bags on the kitchen counter and Ambrose just heads out to get the last bag from the car. At this precise moment, as Ambrose is walking down his driveway towards the car, Richard Chase is driving past. He's looking for someone to kill. Driving down the street, Richard aims the gun out of the window and takes two shots, hitting Ambrose. Gail Griffin, Ambrose's daughter-in-law, is holding the front door open for him and as she hears the shot, she turns around and sees Ambrose falling to the floor. Carol hears the commotion but doesn't hear the gunshots. She runs outside and finds her husband lying on the ground and he says to her, I've been shot. Despite this, Carol thinks that he's having a heart attack and he's a little bit delusional. I can only assume there wasn't much blood there. 
and the ambulance arrives quickly and the family still believe it's a heart attack as he's rushed away to hospital um, only the ambulance staff do realise that it's a gunshot and the police are called to the scene. Ambrose Griffin was pronounced dead at a hospital at 9.15pm just 45 minutes after returning home from the grocery store and the police were absolutely baffled by this because Robertson Avenue was a really nice area. Shooting here was practically unheard of. Over the next few days they dig into Ambrose's life expecting to find something, some kind of enemy, some kind of motive but all they find is that Ambrose was a perfectly normal, nice guy with a normal family, a normal job. He had no enemies. There was nobody who would want to kill him. It just seemed to be a completely random attack. And as we know, murders without motives are the hardest to solve. The police find very little evidence of anything whatsoever at the scene. It was just a drive-by shooting. That was it. And because it happened at night, the searches couldn't really commence until the next day. Um, the shell casings weren't found for a couple of days. They were later found by a news crew who pulled up on Robertson Avenue to do a piece on the shooting. And they find two shell casings in the road about 80 foot away from the Griffin's house. Um, one of the shell casings was completely flattened, like it had been run over a lot of times. The other one was still perfect. The only thing the police could assume is that when the gun was fired out the car window, the casings went on top of the car and rolled off further down the road. Um, and they really didn't give the police much of a clue apart from the fact that it was a 22 caliber pistol used. And whilst the Griffin family is trying to pick up the pieces of what happened to Ambrose, Richard Chase goes about his normal life. On January 16th, he's walking down a suburban road when he walks into a garage and sets some newspapers on a shelf alight. Luckily, this fire is discovered really quickly and it's extinguished before anything awful can happen. Um, but Richard said that he did this because he thought the people in the neighborhood were spying on him and he wanted to cause some kind of distraction. But he also said that he knocked on the front door of the house first to make sure nobody was in and nobody would get hurt. Um, he does the same again a few days later in a different residence, this time going through the rear window and setting the curtains alight. His family said that during this time Richard was acting perfectly normal, but what normal is for Richard Chase? I don't really know. And then on January 23rd, 1978, things reached the next level. Ambrose Griffin's murder was almost a small mercy compared to what Richard Chase was going to do next. He leaves his apartment on Watt Avenue and heads off on foot, walking several blocks to Benice Street, where he arrives between 9 and 10 a.m. He's wearing a blue jacket with rubber gloves and a loaded gun. He comes to 2909 Beneath Street and he sees that there's no car in the driveway so he goes around the back of the house to try and force the door open. Only somebody is in the house, Jeanne Layton is watching television, she sees Richard and she shouts and he runs away. So then he heads to 2929 Beneath Street which is the home of the Edwards family. He breaks in through a rear window, it's empty and he starts right rifling through drawers and boxes. He steals cash and any valuables he can get his hands on, as well as urinating in a drawer full of clothes and defecating on a child's bed. But the Edwards family arrive home before Chase can leave and they see him as he flees out of the back door and he jumps over a fence. Miss Edwards isn't about to let him go so he tries to chase him on foot before chasing him in the car but eventually Chase escapes. At approximately 11.45 a.m. he makes his way to Pantry Market which was a grocery store nearby. Um, at this point he has returned to his apartment and he's changed into this bright orange parka jacket and at this point he looks absolutely disgusting. His lack of personal hygiene is really really obvious. He's easily noticeable walking down the street stinking wearing this bright orange parka. Um, when he arrives at Pantry Market, he actually runs into an old high school friend called Nancy Westfall. Chase spots her and goes over to her saying, weren't you on Kurt's motorcycle when he was killed? Now Kurt was an old high school boyfriend of Nancy who died in a motorcycle accident and Nancy replies no before Richard identifies himself as Rick. Um, she recognises him as Rick Chase and then he just walks away. But he comes back a few minutes later and Nancy, unable to avoid him, just starts making small talk. Um, they head to the tills together and Nancy is like trying to pay as quickly as she can so she can get out and just escape from this weird guy. Um, and so as she rushes out and gets to her car, Richard's following her and he tries to get into her car. He grabs the passenger door handle of her car as she speeds away and luckily he doesn't get in. Um, he then just turns around and walks away towards Tioga Avenue. 
On Teoga Avenue lived Teresa Wallen. She was three months pregnant and happily cleaning her home when Chase opens her front door and shoots her immediately with his 22 caliber pistol. His first shot, he actually shoots through her hand. She's raised her hand to her head to protect herself and he's shot right through her hand and the bullets only grazed her head. The second shot, he shoots directly into her jaw, breaking her jawbone. The third shot goes into her brain, killing her. Whilst wearing rubber gloves, he drags her body to the rear bedroom. He was aware enough that what he was doing was wrong, that he was wearing rubber gloves to try and cover his tracks. Um, he undresses Teresa and he uses a knife from her own kitchen to mutilate her body. He attacks specific organs, he opens up her torso and just starts cutting the spleen out. He cuts the pancreas in half, he targets her stomach and liver. He pulls out all of her intestines and removes her kidneys before putting them back in a different part of her body. He has an empty yoghurt cup with him which he uses to fill up with her blood and drink it. Um, she's then stabbed through her left breast, the knife going directly into her lungs. He places dog poo from the garden in her mouth and then goes to the bathroom and just washes up. He cleans the knife and places it back on the dish rack before leaving to go home and just watching television. Um, Teresa is sadly discovered by her husband later that night and police soon attend the scene saying it was the most gruesome thing they'd ever seen. Of course, David is questioned extensively. He's the prime suspect in this to begin with. He's the husband, but they soon realized that he had nothing to do with it. The two of them were really happily married. The police were at a complete loss. The next morning was the 24th of January. It's between 10 and 10.30 a.m. when Chase walks up a driveway on Sunview Avenue. Whilst Chase is stood at the door, he asks the person who answers if they have any old magazines they can sell him. The person says no and Chase walks away. Multiple times that day, he would go up to random houses and ask them if they had any old magazines to sell. And he also spoke to his grandmother that day, asking if she wanted to go for a picnic. Um, he heads to a house where he had previously bought a puppy and breaks in, killing a Labrador and drinking its blood. On the 27th, Chase walks to Merrywood Drive, which is a road he had cased a couple of days earlier. He heads to 3207 Merrywood Drive, owned by 36-year-old Evelyn Maroth. Evelyn lived there with her two sons, 13-year-old Vernon and 6-year-old Jason. She had a boyfriend called Daniel Meredith, who just happened to be visiting that morning. She didn't work, but she did babysit her nephew, David, and he'd been dropped off at her house about 7am that morning. Now, 13-year-old Vernon luckily wasn't in the house with Evelyn that morning. And at 8.30 a.m., a opposite neighbor of Evelyn comes over and asks if Jason would want to come to the mountains to play in the snow with her and her two daughters. Evelyn says, yes, of course, but can you just give me some time until 10 a.m. to go out and get Jason some new snowshoes? Um, only 10 a.m. comes and goes and Jason never arrives at the neighbor's house. The neighbor sees Daniel Meredith's red car in the driveway at 9.30 a.m. It leaves and then comes back around 10.30 a.m. Only around 10 a.m. Richard was walking down Merrywood when he notices that the garage door at Evelyn's house is open. Now this is something important to note when it comes to Chase. He would only ever enter a home if the door was unlocked. So he took it as a sign that he was allowed to enter, which is another very vampire-esque thing about Chase. It's also the reason that I always keep my doors locked. Chase enters the home and encounters Evelyn in the hallway, shooting her directly in the brain. Now, baby David, Evelyn's nephew, was asleep in his crib and we can only assume that he woke up and started crying when he heard the gunshot, which leads Chase directly to where he was. Um, Chase takes the baby and his brain matter is later found in the bathtub, where it's thought that Chase took the baby, killed him and drank his blood. At some point around 10.30, Chase is interrupted when Daniel Meredith returns back to the house with six-year-old Jason in tow. Daniel Meredith had just taken Jason out to get some new snowshoes, which Jason was wearing when he was later found. Um, Chase immediately kills them both with a gunshot. Once Chase has privacy, he mutilates the body of Evelyn, just as he did with Teresa. He drags her into the bathroom before into the bedroom and draping her over the edge of the bed. Her wounds were very, very similar to that of Teresa's, only Evelyn also had her neck slashed and her right eye removed. At 11.05, the neighbor was still waiting for Jason to come over, so sends her six-year-old daughter, Tracy, over to the house to knock. 
Tracy knocks on the front door and Richard at this point is still in the home. Um, he sees Tracy and decides in the moment to just escape. He easily could have dragged the six year old into the house and done the same, but he takes the baby and he runs. He takes Daniel's keys and steals his red car in the driveway, driving it back to his apartment. The horror inside Evelyn's house was later discovered by a neighbour and the police arrive almost immediately, scarred by the scene they were to see. Um, it was immediately linked straight to Teresa's murder. The authorities quickly head out onto the street looking for eyewitness accounts, anyone who had seen anything weird. Nobody had seen anything to do with the murder but quite a few people reported seeing a scruffy looking white male in their mid 20s with long hair just wandering around the streets. Of course the police this didn't make him a suspect but it meant that somebody weird was wandering around and this was interesting. He'd been spotted by multiple people just walking the streets multiple days beforehand leading the police to believe that whoever this guy was he was from pretty close by and therefore it should be quite easy to find. Richard Chase committed all of these crimes within a one mile radius of his home. He was smart enough to wear rubber gloves so he wouldn't be caught but he wasn't smart enough to travel out of the area. He also left perfect hand and shoe prints throughout the homes. The only problem the police had with this description was that well a they couldn't necessarily link him to the murders he was just a weird guy wandering around and b this physical description was of a scruffy looking white male with long hair in his 20s. And the only problem was that in California, this was pretty much every male in his 20s. This was kind of the style. It really didn't help them narrow anything down. So they start with classic police work. They start canvassing the streets, they're knocking on doors, they're talking to every single person they can, they're leaving no stone unturned. Um, the police were pretty sure by this point that little baby David was already dead, but it was of utmost importance to find him as quickly as possible, just in case he wasn't. Whilst the police were out on the streets canvassing for any information, Richard was back in his apartment, further mutilating the body of baby David. Now it's very rare I get to say this in any case, but in this case, the police work was brilliant. It was top tier work which is incredible when you think about the fact that most of the officers assigned to this case were inexperienced younger officers but they did everything they could and they did everything right this investigation was led by a Lieutenant Ray Biondi. Now Biondi had actually attended a talk by the FBI a couple of years earlier where they spoke about psychological profiling, something which wasn't used too often back in the 1970s, it was a very new concept. You hear about it a lot nowadays, back in the 70s, it wasn't really a thing. But because he'd attended this talk on profiling, Ray Biondi was able to make the following assumptions about the person that they were looking for. And he made these assumptions completely disregarding all of the reports of the scruffy looking white male because as far as they knew, this was just a male wandering the streets. He had nothing to do with the murder. So Biondi noted that the perpetrator was most likely white as nobody in any of these suburban neighborhoods had noticed any minorities, any people of color wandering around. And this was the 70s, people were racist. People would have noticed a person of color wandering the streets. So he made the assumption that the person was white. Beyond he made the assumption that the person had some kind of mental illness as nobody who was mentally healthy would be able to do the things that the perpetrator had done to these bodies. He noted that it was most likely schizophrenia due to the nature of the murders. The murders were incredibly, incredibly disorganized. They were messy. He paid no attention to the fact that he might get caught and he was just the poster boy for a disorganized killer. Beyond he decided that the guy was most likely a loner, unmarried, no family, really he's not close to this family and out of work as all of the murders happened during regular work hours. Um, he said that he definitely lived alone because nobody would be able to live with somebody in this kind of mental state. Beyondi knew that this person most likely wasn't a very social or charismatic person in any way. He didn't care about scaring his victims when they were alive. It wasn't a psychological thing in that way for him. He just wanted to kill them to get to what he needed, which was their blood. Beyondi also said that it was likely that the perpetrator had recently left some kind of mental institution, that somebody with this level of mental health wouldn't have been able to go entirely unnoticed. Beyondi didn't know it at the time, but he just had Richard Chase down to a T and now they had to find him. The FBI actually take a lot of credit for Chase's capture, but they had nothing to do with it whatsoever. It was all Beyondi and the police team. The chase towards Chase started on the 28th, 
When Nancy Westfall calls in, her father was a retired police sergeant and she'd spoken to him about this weird encounter she'd had with Richard Chase and he pushed her to call in to the police. So she calls in to report this very strange meeting. She says, listen, it's probably nothing, but I decided this weird thing when people happen to be murdered. So I just thought I'd let you know. And so the detectives look up this guy's name in the police book. They had nowhere else to look, so they might as well follow this lead. And they find his listed address as 2934 Watt Avenue. But the man living at this address wasn't Richard Chase. This address was an old one. And Chase had actually moved out a while before. So they go to the building manager to try and get a forward address, only the building manager isn't in at this time. So they've got to wait. Whilst they're waiting, Detective Bill Roberts decides to look up Richard Chase in the police system, which at this time wasn't computerised, obviously, it was all just a bunch of index cards. And Roberts finds Chase's criminal history. He had a history of marijuana arrest and also an escape from a local psychiatric hospital, as well as being found in the middle of the desert, covered in blood. And we also found incidents involving the 22 caliber pistols, which they knew was the murder weapon at this point, and Roberts knows that all of this is some kind of strange coincidence. It's got to mean something. So he has his full file pulled. When Roberts opens the file, he immediately sees Chase's latest booking photo and he weirdly enough looks exactly like the guy that everyone is describing. Bill said as soon as he read this file, he knew that Richard Chase was their guy. So eventually they get the forward address and they head to the correct apartment. The police knock on Chase's door, but there's no answer. And the manager says that this isn't unusual. Chase would never answer the door to anyone. Even if his mother came round, it only talked to her through a crack in the door. So Bill decides to head to the office where he calls Richard's landline and he answers the phone. So they know for a fact that he's definitely in there. So the officers loudly pretend to walk away. They pretend that they know that Chase isn't in there and eventually he appears holding a cardboard box. He heads towards the car park and as soon as he sees the police, he throws the box at them and he runs. Um, this box contained bloody rags and papers, brain matter in an envelope and David's nappy pin. Now, of course, Richard Chase isn't exactly hard to capture. Two detectives immediately jump on top of him. Um, one detective actually already told himself that if he captured Richard Chase and he put up any kind of fight, he would just shoot him in the head, treat him the same way he treated his victims. But in the moment, he said that he just couldn't do it. So he ends up hitting him around the head with the barrel of his gun to subdue him. As they're dragging Chase towards the car, he's saying, let me go, I've done nothing wrong. They said that it seemed like Chase was on some kind of drug, but he wasn't confused at all. He knew exactly what was going on. He knew all of the details about himself, but his eyes were darting all over the place. As Chase is taken into custody, it's some detective's jobs to go into his apartment. And the first thing they notice is the smell. It stinks of death and putrefaction. There's blood everywhere, on the carpet, on the walls, over all of the furniture. There's a plate of blood sat on his bed. There's a bloodstained hatchet in the kitchen and a bloodstained machete found in a bedroom drawer. In the freezer, they found a half gallon tub full of animal organs. There were feces on the bedroom floor, as well as newspaper articles about all kinds of violent crimes, including the murders he'd committed. All in all, it was just an absolutely horrifying sight. And then it's time for Chase to be questioned in custody. He gives nothing away. He sits there entirely flat, acting like no one else is in the room with him. He'd only answer select questions, but he wouldn't give anything away whatsoever. He gave them nothing useful. He never once incriminated himself. He said the only thing he'd killed was a dog. Once again, this shows his mental state. He's of sound enough mind to know that if he tells the police he's killed people, he'll be in trouble. But the police knew it was him. They'd already taken his gun and matched it to the gun used at the crime scenes. And Richard said that he was being framed by the Italians. And when he was asked about drinking the blood, he says, you're crazy, I haven't. I'm not mixed up in anything like that. He says a blonde man in an orange parka was responsible for the crimes. Whilst in jail, Chase was withdrawn and uncommunicative. He was convinced that somebody was trying to poison him. He would jump at every single chance he had to have a real doctor, not a psychiatric doctor, examine him. He was determined that he was going to find a cure for all of his medical ailments. Because that's what all this stems from. Remember, he thought he didn't have enough blood in his body. He thought he was dying constantly. The state of California versus Richard Chase would prove to be a monumental trial. It was one of the biggest of its time. Chase was now known in the media as the vampire of Sacramento. 
At this point, Chase's only chance of escaping the death penalty was to have a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity, and his defence's job was to prove that he was indeed insane. The prosecution's job was to prove that he was indeed sane when he committed these murders. There's obviously a huge difference between the public's idea of somebody being insane, being crazy, and the legal definition of being insane. And Richard's life literally depended on whether he was insane or not. The prosecution basically had to prove that Richard knew what he was doing, that he knew he was murdering people, and that he knew murder was wrong. He was originally charged with five counts of murder as the body of baby David was yet to be found. But it was found two months later in a McDonald's cardboard box in the grounds of a church. It was discovered by a janitor. And at this point, he's officially charged with a sixth count of murder. In the May of 1978, Chase is examined by four separate doctors, all four of whom declare that he is competent to stand trial. And then again in the June, they appoint two more doctors, psychiatrists to evaluate him. And they declare that whilst he is clearly mentally impaired and unbalanced, he was aware of his actions whilst he committed murder. Um, he was fully aware of what he was doing whilst he was doing it. Some doctors actually disagreed with his diagnosis of schizophrenia, believing it to be something else, but I couldn't find out what they thought this something else was. One doctor noted, my opinion is that Richard was seeking relief from intolerable distress associated with his belief that he was being poisoned to death and that his belief was due to a severe chronic mental disorder. He believed that drinking blood was a possible solution to save him from certain death. He understood that he was killing people and he understood that it was wrong to kill people. In a nutshell, yes, he was mentally ill, but he still understood that killing people was wrong and he did it anyway. The fact that he was with it enough to wear rubber gloves in an attempt to cover his tracks says a lot. The fact that he wouldn't admit to the police what he'd done also says a lot. He was disturbed, but not legally insane. The defence realised quickly that a trial in Sacramento was never going to be fair, so it's eventually moved to Santa Clara County, which just happens to be where Richard was born. The trial begins on January 2nd, 1979, over a year since his first murder, and it lasts for months. Richard talks on the stand about murdering Teresa, but denies remembering murdering Evelyn and her family. By May, they completely dismissed the insanity plea and on the 8th of May, the jury took five hours to decide that he was guilty on all six counts of first degree murder. The judge sentences him to die in the gas chamber. He's sent to San Quentin Penitentiary to await his death, but he was to spend many, many years on death row. California is notorious for taking decades to send people to their deaths. Um, I do think that despite the fact he was found legally sane, he may have been better off being put in some kind of psychiatric hospital. Not so much for the safety of himself, but perhaps for the safety of his other inmates. Um, whilst he's in prison, he grants a series of interviews to FBI agent Robert Ressler, during which he gives a very strange insight into his brain. He talks about UFOs and Nazis. He says that he was forced to kill people to keep himself alive, that anybody else would do it. Um, he also says he believes his inmates are trying to poison him. And on that last count, he wasn't too far from the truth. His inmates in prison were terrified of him, this vampire guy who would murder people and drink their blood. And so they tried to convince him to commit suicide, which is exactly what he did. On the 26th of December, 1980, Richard took an overdose of antidepressants that he'd been saving up and killed himself. And that is the story of Richard Chase, who I think is the most disturbing killer I've ever covered on this channel. He's the reason that I always lock my door whenever I come into my house. From the moment I first read about him, I got paranoid, and now whether I'm popping into my house for 30 seconds, I will always lock that front door and you should too. There's no denying that Richard Chase's mental health had a big impact on the things he did, and he should never have been allowed to leave the psychiatric hospital. It was clear that he wasn't going to stop drinking blood. They'd find him in the bushes, in the grounds, eating birds. In hindsight, it's incredibly clear that he was gonna go on to do more than just kill birds. The mental health system did fail him in this aspect. He should never have been allowed out in public. But he fully understood that killing people was wrong, and he went to do it anyway. He took steps to try and cover up his tracks. He may have been mentally ill, but he wasn't insane. 
Other people with schizophrenia do not go on to do the things that he did. I think this might incite some really interesting discussions down below about mental health, so I can't wait to read what all you guys think about this case. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what I'm doing here on my channel and would like to support me, the links to my pin store and my Patreon are in the top lines of the description down below. I'd be really grateful if you want to go check those out. Let me know who you want me to cover in next month's Serial Killer Spotlight video, and I'll see you then. Bye, guys.